All right, we'll turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Continuing on in our message series uh, that we started a couple weeks ago, uh, as we're going to go verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number 2. Uh, as you well know, this book, uh, some people call it the Apocalypse, some call it the Revelation, it's of Yeshua the Messiah, uh, written, of course, by John from the island of Patmos. Uh, the book is initially sent out to Ephesus, and then, of course, the surrounding congregations in and around the area. So it's written and sent to assemblies. Uh, but assemblies are made up of individuals. Okay, assemblies are made up of individuals. Let him who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And so each and every one of us, whether it's in a local assembly like this, a local congregation, or a much broader body of Messiah, commonly referred to as the church, all right, we are all members of it. We're all members. And you know, personally speaking, just your own health, if there's something in your body that, that, is, that is hurting, uh, that, that has been injured, uh, perhaps a, a disc in your back, uh, arthritis in a knee or a joint, uh, maybe you have a migraine headache, uh, uh, something like a, uh, something going on with the shoulder, whatever it is, the other parts of your body are going to be affected by it. It's just a matter of time, okay? Spiritually speaking, it's no different. We're all members within the body. And so when you're hurting, when you're suffering, when you're not walking right, whatever it is, it's going to affect the people next to you. And it's going to affect the people behind you, in front of you. It's going, to affect, it's going to affect the entire body in some way, shape, or form. And so this book is being sent off to congregations. But lay he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So let's pray before we dig in. Abba, we thank you again for preserving your word. And Lord, we want to dig into this uh, uh, important chapter. And, and uh, Lord, there's much to glean from it, much that can be applied uh, to us as individuals, uh, to us uh, uh, in, a, in a congregational setting, the body even itself. Lord, uh, open up our eyes, open up our minds and our hearts to what you have for us today. And most importantly, help us to apply these principles uh, for your honor, for your glory, in Yeshua's name, we come to you in prayer as always. Amen. Verse 1. To the messenger of the congregation in Ephesus, right, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Ephesus, uh, once I tell you this, I really suggest you go back and read through Ephesus. You'll have a, a, a more clearer understanding. Ephesus was the hub of the Roman Empire in regards to the occult, witchcraft, sorcery, idolatry, magic. Ephesus was the hub. Now go back when you read Ephesus and you'll see Paul, who he's, who he's trying to address. Ephesus was well known for the worship of Artemis, uh, also known as Diana of the Ephesians. Uh, if you do a, a, a internet search for Artemis or Diana, uh, you'll see uh, perhaps a figurine. You might see a, a statue or a painting uh, of a goddess with a, a multiplicity of breasts hanging off of her, showing that she can satisfy and supply the needs for all of those who worship her. Uh, Caesar Augustus had allowed Ephesus to build two temples to his honor. Uh, Domitian uh, had actually called Ephesus, quote, uh, the guardian, the guardian of the imperial cult. 
And so you have all this going on. And so really, the emergence of false teachers should really come as no surprise to us whatsoever. Right? The indication here is that Yeshua, from Yeshua is that these Ephesian believers, they could recognize a false teacher. They could, recognize, they could recognize false doctrines. They could recognize false practices. They could recognize those walking in claiming to be apostles when they weren't. Folks, we got a lot of that going on today in and amongst the charismatic movement. Many people, many men walking around calling themselves apostles who have no right to call themselves an apostle. They, they don't have the qualifications. They don't have the credentials. And yet they're calling themselves apostles. And so these Ephesian believers could spot that. They had the proper discernment. Very, very commendable. He says that you cannot, cannot tolerate evil men. He says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. So it was a very active congregation. Very active. And apparently, this is their, your, your perseverance. So there was some friction against what they were doing. They persevered. He uses the term Nicolaitans. Now, according to scholars, that's like an unsure kind of term. It's not referring to a land. Uh, but the word itself means to conquer the people. And so apparently what it seems like, like these false teachers, false apostles, would come in using their influence, using their position, whoever they were, right, teaching false things, false practices, and, and trying to lord themselves over the people. So, man, I mean, let's check off this list. We've got a sacrificing congregation. We've got a very active congregation. They've persevered. They have the gift of discernment. They can spot a false teacher. They can spot a false apostle. My goodness, what could possibly be the problem? I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Say, so, they were doing this right, and 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 they were doing this right. But everything they were doing right didn't justify what they were doing wrong. See, they were doing this, and they were doing it. They had thorough acts of service, thorough deeds. They persevered. They had discernment and everything. But guess what their fatal flaw was? No love for the brethren. You left your first love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And they didn't do that. And folks, in any relationship, any congregation, any church, any assembly that does not show love for the brethren, does not show compassion for the brethren, does not come together to meet the needs of the brethren, without question, Yeshua can remove the lampstand, remove his light easily. Keener, and you'll hear me quote him a number of times, his commentary is solid. But he says, he writes, quote, a church where love ceases can no longer function properly as a local expression of Christ's many-membered body. This is one of the offenses for which a lampstand can be moved from its place, through which a church can ultimately cease to exist as a church. Some churches die from lack of outreach, lack of planning for the rising generation, or lack of courtesy to visitors. Some churches, like the church in Ephesus, may risk simply killing themselves off by how they treat others. And that was it. They did so many things right with no love. No love. Labor is not a substitute for love. Let me repeat it. Labor is not a substitute for love. You take a husband or a father in a home, and he goes out and he works eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, and he's working, and he's making sure the rent is paid and the mortgage is paid and the bills are paid and there's food in the refrigerator and there's clothes on, on the children's backs, and he's doing this and he's doing this and he's doing this and he's doing this and shows no love towards his wife. He shows no love towards his children. Just don't have time. Guess what? Well, I'm doing my job. No, you're not. Labor is no substitute for love. If you go, if you go to Ephesus today, today, you know what you'll find? Nothing. Stones and rubble. That's it. Verse 8, 
and to the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna, write the first and the last who is dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not but a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. A little bit of history. Uh, remember, John is writing this at the end of the first century. Several decades prior, <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but Judea waged war against Rome. Not a smart thing to do. And they were squashed. Of course, you had the destruction of the temple and everything. Following that outburst, which was unsuccessful, Rome levied a special tax against Jewish people. If you were Jewish, you had to pay a special tax. So by the time John is writing this, or being, you know, dictating, the Jewish people in the end of the first century under Rome, man, they just want peace. My goodness. They, they, they had to pay the tax, okay? Rome was still recognizing Judaism as a religion, but that was waning very thin. Their patience with Judaism was waning very thin. And the Jewish people, they were even being taxed. We still have Judaism. We don't have a temple anymore. For heaven's sakes, just leave us alone. Rome, okay, had the imperial cult. Caesar is divine. Rome had no tolerance for anything outside of its cult or Judaism as defined by the Sanhedrin. Now, by the end of the first century, believers, the way, are starting to be called Christians. Where do you think the Christians fall in on this? They don't fall under the banner of the Roman imperial cult, and they don't fall under the banner of Judaism. And so what does Yeshua say? I know your tribulation. I know your tribulation. I know what you're going through. I know your tribulation and your poverty but you are rich. See, they always say, it's who you know that counts. Watch. Smyrna, and this was, other cities, we'll see it in a, in a, in a moment. Smyrna had an economic network, okay? Trade guilds. They're kind of like what you would look at today like the unions. And Smyrna had an economic network. And if you as a believer... Okay, you don't fall underneath the imperial cult. You're not recognizing Caesar as divine. And you're not falling under Judaism, right? Okay, so where does that leave you? And so the believers, late first century in Smyrna, guess what? If you had a business or a trade, right? You were kept out of the trade guilds. No one wanted to do business with you. Imagine having a, a, a music business or, or, or a, a, a catering business or what have you. And now everywhere you go, no one wants to do business with you. And now you're starting to suffer financially. I know your poverty, he says. You're rich. You're rich in him, but I know what you're going through. You're suffering financially. And he says, and I know the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not. Now what could possibly he be talking about? Here it is. You had some Jewish people under the auspices of the Roman Empire who were collaborating with Roman officials in the various provinces, ratting out the Christians. So you see? So you say, listen, by the way, Rome, Rome, guess what? Okay? I just want you to know that one over there, he's a Christian. And that one over there, that he's a believer. And, and that's what these Jewish people were doing. They were ratting out the believers to Rome. So, hey, we're good, right? Ah. Yeshua's point of view is the same as John's point of view, is the same as Paul's point of view. And what did Paul write Romans 2? Romans 2.28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Ah, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. 
and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit. Yeshua, as far as Yeshua is concerned, and Paul is concerned, your Jewishness, ethnically speaking, means nothing. Nothing. We have a multiplicity of different cultures in here. Right? Right? Hortense. Hortense is a believer of, of J, uh, Jamaican descent. Jewish heart. Elite. Haitian descent. Jewish heart. Right? Italian. Italian over here. Jewish heart. Latino. Jewish heart. See? It's the heart. The heart has been circumcised. You may look different. All of you, may, we all may be looking different on the outside. But if God has saved your soul, he took off the heart of stone, he puts in the heart of flesh, and he circumcises the heart, and he writes the Torah on your heart. You're a believer. So what is Yeshua saying? These ethnically Jewish people who are going around ratting out the believers to the, to the Roman officials, oh, on the outside they may be Jewish, but on the inside they're Gentiles and they're pagans. They're pagans. Any religion, any religion, any cult, any assembly, any shul, any church, any synagogue, any temple, anyone that doesn't teach that Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. There's no, under, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Anybody teaches anything other than that, you're doing the devil's work. And according to Yeshua, what, where do they belong? To the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue of Satan. Whew. I had, and I've had a no, this is troubling. I've had a number of believers down through the years. Thankfully, not many, but a handful. I've talked to people come in. Wh- you know, how did you find out about us? So and so, oh, and where, did, where were you going before? You're, you're saved, believers. Oh, yes, saved, but wonderful. Uh, okay, where were you going before? Well, we were going to Chabad Synagogue. Okay. Other people, believers, say, well, we had to go out of town for a funeral or a, or a birthday or whatever it was, a wedding. So what did you do on Shabbat? Well, we, we visited a Chabad Synagogue. Why on earth would you go there? Well, they had a wonderful Torah service and the Torah scroll and they read the, the liturgy and everything. They read, read liturgy. They said prayers? In whose name? In whose name? Yeshua is our high priest. Without Yeshua as a high priest, your prayers to God aren't getting past the ceiling. You have no access to God without a high priest, and ours is Yeshua. That, that veil was torn in two. When he said, it is finished, there is no more Aaronic priesthood anymore. Now he's the high priest, as in the order of Melchizedek. All our prayers go to him and through him. And so now you're praying in whose name? There are nothing but dead people there. There's no Holy Spirit there. They're all lost. Why on earth would you ever go there? And, and I, I've, I've tried to tell people before, if you're out of town, and, and you have two options, right, as a believer. You got a Chabad synagogue on a Shabbat, or you got a Baptist church on a Sunday. I'm going to tell you, go to the Baptist church. At least you're getting, you're getting the Lord. At least you're getting Jesus. At least there's the Holy Spirit there, and there's brothers and sisters in the Lord there. What kind of, what kind of comparison do we have with the lost? Come out from, under, from away from them. It's the synagogue of Satan. He said, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Yeshua says, for your faith, you're going to be hated. They're going to hate you for your message. You will be tested. Some of you are going to be cast into prison. You will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. I sometimes wonder, as here in America, we've got it so good. And I wonder, I truly wonder, if the police or the military came walking through those doors, who in here confesses Jesus as Lord or Yeshua as as divine? Who in here? Would we be willing to be shackled and thrown into jail? And I hope so. See, that's not a popular message. You can be cast into prison. 
You'll be tested. You will have tribulation. Faithful unto death. I don't hear that message from prosperity gospel television. I just don't. Oh, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be I had a, he's a sweet, sweet man who told me over a year ago, oh, God wants you to be wealthy, and he wants you to be wealthy, and you'll have wealth and riches, and wealth and riches, and riches and wealth, and you'll have all this money, and you'll have all this money, and you'll have wealth and riches. And you ha- Well, if God wants me to be wealthy, I guess I'll be wealthy, but if he doesn't, I better be content with what I have. <laughs> okay? Be faithful unto death. Are are we willing to take a stand to the point where, hey, you know what? You're going to take your head off. See, we all have this wonderful thought, and trust me, I want to go the way Enoch went, right? I want to go that way. I don't want to, I'm not afraid of death, but I don't want to die. I, I don't like that process. I always wonder. I, I, go, I go to rehab hospitals and nursing homes, and I see what happens to people later on in their years, and, and it concerns me. It's like, please, dear Lord God, I don't want to go like that. They're, they're just shells. They're just shells. I, 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 I see a person every single Wednesday, and, and she just she walks through. She's 95 years old. She walks with her walker, talking to no one. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello, and that's all she does. Man, I, I, I want my health. I, I want my mind, okay? But I have no control over that. I, I want to go Enoch's way. We all want to go Enoch's way, right? Be faithful, walk with God, and God takes us, right? We all want to hear the, sh- the trumpet. We all want to be raptured. Nobody wants to go the way of Abel. Abel was faithful too, and his brother murdered him. I want to go Enoch's way. Are we willing to go Abel's way? Verse 12, and to the messenger of the congregation in Pergamum, right, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows, but he who receives it. Listen, if you're a believer, and I'm talking to believers here, okay, you are the enemy of Satan. Satan hates you. But you see, it depends on how much of a threat you are. If you're a threat to him and what he's trying to accomplish... He will attack you. If you're, man, Satan never attacks me. You know what that means? You're not a threat. Not going to waste his time. But if you're a threat, he's coming after you. And I'll tell you what, he's either going to come as a roaring lion or he's going to come as a sneaky snake. And more often than not, folks, more often than not, he's not coming as the lion. When it comes to churches, when it comes to congregations, families, marriages, and things like that, He doesn't come at you like a lion. No. You know what happens? Many churches get attacked this way. Congregations like that. Okay? Many. You know what happens? The weeds come in. They slither in. They slither in. Sometimes, sometimes they have a position. Maybe they're a university professor or a doctor or a lawyer. They're in real estate. They're in finance. And they they, they wave around a big checkbook. And what they do is they settle down, they get nice and comfortable, right? They kind of, you know, and oftentimes, sometimes pastors, rabbis, deacons, elders, overseers, right? They lack discernment. They lack discernment and they can't spot the weeds. And then the weeds settle down. And folks, if you let a weed sit in your lawn long enough, you know what happens? The roots start to dig in. And man, once the roots dig in, I don't know if you've ever pulled weeds. They're hard to pull out. It's like you've got to kill them with poison. 
<laughs> Figuratively speaking. So, but this is what they do. And they come in and they get really nice and they hey, how are you, brother? And everything. And, and, but they, they bring false practices with them and they bring false doctrines with them and they bring false teachings and they sit there for a while. I, mean, I, I don't advise doing this, okay? But if you have a neighbor who has a wonderful lawn, right? All right, d- don't do this. But if you had a neighbor who has a wonderful lawn and you wanted to ruin their lawn, just plant a few weeds. Because what will happen is if the owner, right, doesn't spot the weeds and doesn't kill the weeds, the weeds will spread. And the weeds will take out the lawn. If you leave nature to itself, if you don't fertilize, if you don't put uh, lawn food down, if you don't take care of the weeds, if you don't do those things, if you just let nature handle itself, the weeds take over. It's like that all the time. And that's how churches get attacked. He says, so you also have some who are in the same way holding the teaching of the Nicolaitans. See, Ephesus had the proper discernment. Ephesus could spot a false teacher. Ephesus could spot a false apostle. Pergamum could not. And their doors were open to anybody and everything. Remember, Pergamum was... They, Pergamum had a, a, Rome had a soft spot in their heart for Pergamum because Pergamum helped Rome when Rome was expanding their empire. Pergamum helped Rome w- uh, battle the kings of the Mediterranean. Pergamum helped them, Rome. And so as far as Rome was concerned, Pergamum was A-OK. Pergamum was a place, Yeshua says, where Satan's throne is. Now, that reference is unclear, but most believe it's in regards to the number of pagan temples that were littered all over Pergamum. Now, all the major cities had pagan temples, mind you, but Pergamum had more than all. And Pergamum was well known for the healing cult of Asclepius. Now, Corinth had one too, Asclepius, but not like Pergamum. The healing cult, remember, In the ancient world, you had all these pagan temples, all the gods, this, that, and the other. And the heathen would go to these temples. One of the ways that you worshipped your gods was having intercourse with the temple prostitutes. Okay? Um, I think Aphrodite, if I'm not mistaken, Aphrodite had like a thousand prostitutes that worked in her temple. thousand of them. So if you go in as a heathen, you could have sex with a man. You get, with a woman, with a man and a woman. It didn't matter. Whatever you, the money you had went towards your worship. And unfortunately, you, you, I don't know if you want the, the little one here. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, getting, into some, we're getting into some weeds. <laughs> Thank you. It's going to get a little messy. I, I, but I need you to understand what's going on in this ancient world. Let, let, let them know when we're done. You see, sexual immorality was so rampant throughout the ancient world. What goes along with sexual immorality? Sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. And so the heathen were ravaged by these sexually transmitted diseases. And so, as a heathen, what they would do as Clepius, the heathen would form clay votives, V-O-T-I-V-E-S. And they would form them in the body part that you were suffering from, whether it was a vagina or whether it was a penis. And you would take this clay votive to the temple of Asclepius, begging the god for healing for that particular body part. Pergamum was well known for that. Jewish ancient literature uh, outside of the Bible looked at Pergamum and and it was slated in their writings that that Pergamum was slated for divine destruction. That's how wicked it was as a city where Satan's throne is. And and so sometimes I wonder, man, if if God was going to destroy the United States, where would he start? 
I mean, I could pick a few off the top of my head. Which, you know, we won't go there right now. I, I, I think we're good. But in the face of all of this, in the face of all this, one man stood up for his faith, Antipas. He stood up for his faith. He stood up for truth, and they killed him. And they killed him. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Now, Balaam was a gun for hire. He was a prophet who was greedy for money. And he lured Israel into sin, the sin of syncretism. Now, folks, let's talk about the misses on the right over here. The body of Messiah today is ravaged by the cancer of syncretism. And it's getting worse, it seems, by the day. Syncretism is the blending of that which is holy which, with that which is unholy. And folks, it's, it's sad to say, but so many believers, we're, we're, we're blending it very well with this world. Very well. We're... we're <sighs> In just preparation for this, when we were down the street, we would come in sometimes, we had our own place, we would come in like for uh, Sukkot, we'd build the sukkah. And sometimes we'd do it like on a Sunday morning, most guys were available Sunday. So we'd come in on Sunday to build the sukkah out there. And there was, in the office plaza, there was another church that was there. Okay, and they, some folks, by the time 11, uh, 11 o'clock came in, the folks would start coming to church. Well, we're over building the sukkah. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the way the young ladies were dressed and the 20-year-olds were dressed, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not lying. I didn't know if they, were, I'm, if they were hookers or if they were going to church. It, it looked like they were going to a nightclub. And, I, and, and we saw that, and it was like, I mean, the, the skirts are all the way up to here, and the heels are this high. And I'm looking, and, and it's just like, as guys were just standing there, and it was like, okay, did daddy let you out of the house like that? And how is the pastor letting you in? I mean, as a wife, those of you who are, who are ladies, wives right now, would you like your husband sitting next to your husband and a little something or other come walking in dressed like that? I don't think so. That's, that's, not, a, eh, that, that's, that's not a good environment. That's not a godly environment. And, but believers, it's syncretism, and we're dressing like the world, and, and we have dependency, where, whether, it's, whether it, it, it's prescription drugs or illegal drugs or alcohol or, or what have you, and we're, we're, we're involved in the, the entertainment industry, and we're watching the movies, and we're watching the, 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 the listening to the rap music and the filthy lyrics that are being broadcast in rap music, and it's like, hey, well, it's, hey, that's the way the world is now. Syncretism. Syncretism. Keener in his book, he, brings, he makes mention of this. And he says, look at our young people. Now, he wrote this about 15 years ago. He said, our young people, our young ladies, we're appalled. We're appalled when a woman sells herself for money. We're appalled by it. But how many of our girls and how many of our daughters and things like that are selling themselves through their boyfriend for absolutely nothing? Syncretism. And these Nicolaitans were, were teaching, saying, hey, you need to compromise. You just need to accommodate. I mean, if you want to take part in the pagan dinners or the pagan festivals or the pagan banquets, well, you go right ahead. That's not, well, I mean, that's the way the world is. Syncretism. Yeshua says, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. You don't, have to, you don't have to lower your standards, Yeshua says. You don't have to take part in the pagan banquets and the pagan dinners and the pagan holidays. You don't have to eat their food. I've got manna for you. I supplied manna for the children for 40 years. I can do it for you too. You don't have to compromise. I will give them a white stone. What does that mean? Sometimes stones were handed as like tickets, and you would use the, the stone to, to get, have entrance or access to the pagan banquets and the dinners. More often than not, this is in reference to a jury. If you sat on the jury, you were handed a black stone and a white stone. 
The white stone, acquittal, innocence. The black stone, guilt. And you would cast the stone after you heard the case. Yeshua says, I will give him a white stone. That means repent. Just repent of what you're doing and come back to me and I'll wipe it all clean. You're not guilty. All you got to do is repent. He says, I'll give you a new name written on the stone. What's a new name? It means a new beginning. Right? Abram, Abraham. Sarai, Sarah. Jacob, Israel. I'll give you a new name. We'll start all over again. Aren't you glad we serve a God who doesn't hold grudges against us? Man, we come to him, we can come to him so filthy dirty, and we can come to him and say, please, dear Lord God, I repent, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And he's like, let's wipe the slate clean. We'll start all over. That's the God we serve. 18, and to the messenger of the congregation of Thyatira, right, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they, they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her in a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the congregations will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira do not hold this teaching. You have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. And I give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. Thyatira was well known for merchants and crafts and once again trade guilds. Once again. And so the believers, right, refused to join the trade guilds, all right? Imagine, like, I was thinking, like, in New York, right? Some of you from New York. Imagine being in the construction business, but you're not in the union. Ooh, good luck, all right? So these trade guilds, right, by refusing to, to join up with the trade guilds, you risk financial hardship. Well, the thing about it is, as a believer, if you went ahead and, man, I got I to gotta join this trade guild, well, guess what? These trade guilds had meetings, and the meetings had banquets. And what do you think was the meal that was provided for at the banquet? The meal was provided in honor of that particular trade guild's patron deity. And so you see how the imperial cult had, was not only just like a religion, it had now, those tentacles had, fo- had found its way even into the business world by the end of the first century. 19, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. So they're staying busy and they're displaying vast amounts of acts of charity. That's wonderful, but I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, it's interesting because when you look back at Jezebel, biblically speaking, I mean, she wasn't a prophetess. So she was referring to someone or a particular system as a prophetess. What Jezebel did do was that she sponsored spiritual harlotry against God's people. So you've got Pergamum, compromise, right, syncretism. You've got Thyatira, compromise. But they're different. In Pergamum, you compromise for the sake of what your body requires or desires, for food, for drink, for entertainment, for all these things. But Thyatira, no, you compromise for money. For money. That's it. You compromise. See, and so... You've got to compromise. You've got to compromise with the Roman imperial cult because if you don't, you're going to be kept out of the trade guilds. And listen, you're going to suffer. And you, you can't have that. You've got bills to pay. You've you got, you got a mortgage to pay. You've got a rent to pay. 
You, you, you need the promotion. Think about it. If you just compromise a little bit, it, the boss will like it. You'll get the promotion. You'll make more money. Imagine what the wonderful things you can do with all the money you'll make. You can pay your bills, you can have a scholarship for your children, and all these wonderful things. Just compromise a little bit. And Yeshua says that's a false doctrine. You don't have to compromise. You shouldn't compromise. And Yeshua says, you know where that doctrine of Jezebel comes from? Look at verse 24. The deep things of Satan. Satan does that. He gets in and he says, I just, I just need you to compromise a little bit. I, be holy for I'm out. No, God didn't say that. Listen, this is what you do. You just accommodate. That's all you got to do. I mean, so what? So, so what if you got to work? You know, I said, well, big deal, right? Make a little bit of extra money. Come up, go in for a sixth day. You know, be, so what if you, you don't have to read your Bible? You don't have to study your Bible. You don't have to pray. You don't have to do that. My goodness. You've got better things to do with your time. You don't have to give. Yeah, there's a sadaka box over there. But somebody else will pick up the, the tab. Somebody else will do that. You've got bills to pay. You've you got to put food on the table. You've got to put, put clothes on, on, on your children's back. You can't tithe. You can't give an offering. No. No. Let somebody else do that. And Yeshua says that comes from Satan. I told you, he comes at you like a lion or he comes at you like a snake. And more often than not, it's going to be the snake. We're almost done. I talk, this, this, is, this is what he does. I talk with an individual, sweet person, and I said, listen, why don't, why don't you come on Shabbat? Why don't you come and, and be with us in prayer and be with us for the Shabbat talk study and, and for the music and the liturgy and the prayer and the fellowship and the one. It's going to be a wonderful, joyful time. Why don't you come with us on Shabbat? And the person said, yeah, but oh, I, I work so hard during the week and it, the work is so stressful. And by the time I, by the time I get there, on the, by the time Saturday comes around, I'm tired. And and I, and I looked at the person, and I leaned forward, and this person said, I know, that's a terrible excuse. And I said, I'm so glad you said it so I didn't have to do it for you. That is a terrible excuse. See, God has this amazing way about him. When we have to work so much that we don't have time to worship him, hmm, he lets you have enough time to figure it out on your own, and then guess what he does? He just removed that job from you. See, and then you'll have plenty of time to come worship him. Do, would you like that? But he'll give you time. He's long-suffering, okay? But he, it's like those who doesn't chasten, you know, he loves the ones he chastens. Okay, so in conclusion, listen, we don't want to be like the congregation at Ephesus. Rigid orthodoxy, right? Rigid, no love for the brethren. We can't have that. We can't be like Thyatira either, or Pergamon. You just open up the doors to anything and everything for the sake of love. No, no. <laughs> there's truth and there's standards and there's a holiness, right? One Torah. We're going to maintain that. So you have to have a balance. There has to be a balance in everything. Look at, look at even like our music, right? We, we have some, some good messianic music. Every now and then we'll play some Christian music. Every now and then we'll throw an old hymn in there, right? Hey, you know why? Because we come from so many different backgrounds and so many different cultures and so many different upbringings and we're different ages and we all have different likes. But you know what? We're all one in Messiah. We all have the same Holy Spirit. That's what draws us together in unity. We can have different tastes. We can have different styles. We can have all these different things. But our tastes and the cultures and, the, and the, those kind of things should never separate us. It's, it's got to be unity. Unity in him. And embrace one another's cultures. Embrace one another's tastes and our likes and our colors and those kind of things. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Maintain a godly standard. Let he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let's pray.